were at the beginning of the church and one deacon didn't get his prayer answered and said, I'm leaving. I don't believe in God anymore. And he left. Wolves had got to him and destroyed him. I could go into time after time after time with tears I had to protect the sheep God had given me to protect and to stay with them. I, I even fought with God at times, and I said, God, listen, I don't want to come all that way. Don't you know a prophet is not esteemed highly in his own country? I came from Laconia. I was raised in Laconia. And God said, don't question me. You will not be understood, but you've got to stay. I would not be with you today enjoying the fruit of my labors, labors with such beautiful, godly people if I let Satan keep me away. I have fought to be your pastor, and I will fight to be your pastor because God gave you as long as you're my sheep to protect you from the word of false believers and false Christ. Do you realize I've had people who have been accosted by Satan with all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of afflictions. And Satan has said in many cases, you stop preaching against me and I will lift those things. And I couldn't do it. Not even to protect my wife from Parkinson and from cancer. I could not do that. I am called to preach the word of God until my last breath. And it cost me, and it cost the body for me to remain faithful to the word of the living God. I've got such faithful people, such beloved people. One individual, and I'll mention this because he was on our program last week, uh, Cliff, Pastor Cliff Vincent and his wife, Marcia, they sent me a note and they said this, I thank God for all the hugs we received. They needed those hugs. They needed that support. They needed the support that we give them from the church to go into all the world and they're in Indonesia giving the gospel out. It costs them. His wife has Parkinson. It costs them to remain faithful to Almighty God when maybe God has said the same thing to him that he said to me, if you stop doing this, I will let your wife be healed. He puts them on us. Satan is allowed to do that, and it tests our faith. Look at Job. Look at Job. Job who would not compromise. He would not curse God even when his wife turned against him because she couldn't stand the torment, he said, you're like a silly woman. I cannot curse my God. For even if I die, I know in my flesh one day I will see God. He will resurrect me. Children of God, we need to have conviction like we've never had conviction. It is the last day. We need the conviction of a Paul. Now notice, when those wolves came in, they devoured the sheep, not sparing one of them. Number four, in short, a perverted gospel, not the gospel of Jesus Christ, but a perverted gospel, another gospel, infiltrated the church, and error was taught. Many churches just want to know if a person has the right education, if they espouse the right beliefs, 
whether they believe them or not. And what can they do for the church? They never pray many of these churches that are looking for another pastor. They never pray for God to give them the pastor that he wants to give. And the same thing, and I'll say this clearly happens in politics. They're either for Democrats, wherever they are, or Republicans, whatever they teach, or independents, because they want them to embrace their thoughts. How about asking God to put in his person? How about letting God guide us? We're not Democrats. We're not Republicans. We may vote that way at times, but we're not. We're children of God who should ask God, who do you want in? And then vote according to the word of God that's given to us. But we've already made our mind up. Please don't do that. The country cannot survive our mind, only God's mind. And God may want punishment of this country for turning against God, or he may want to give us a lengthy time to repent of our sins and have a good administration. I don't know, but I want God to tell me who to vote for. I don't want politicians to tell me who to vote for because they want to lie in many cases to me, and I want to God give me discernment. We need discernment as Christians. We need discernment as citizens of this great country. The Word of God makes it very clear that even, and he said this to Paul, and Paul related it to them, even the pure-hearted believers were led astray by horrible deception. Peter, a great man of God, he said, I'll die supporting you. And when the time came, he couldn't do it because the word of God wasn't completely transforming his heart and mind. There came a time after God had really transformed his heart and mind that he was willing to die for the cause of Christ and even to be crucified, as many believe, upside down because he, he could not allow himself to die in the same way Jesus died. He was not worthy. Do you understand? God brought him to the end of himself, and he wants to bring you and I to the end of ourselves. Paul was brought to the end of himself, and he wants to bring you and I to the end of ourselves. So it is not I, but Christ that is important in everything we do and everything we say. Those who appeared, who appeared to have it all together, were destroyed by the wolves. For years, this faithful church of Ephesus had been careful to judge what was of the gospel and what was a perversion of the gospel. But now these same believers, and they're in every church, were led into an easy gospel that appealed to the flesh. There are churches that say, don't preach on sin. It's terrible to preach on it. You'll divide. Don't have crosses. Take those crosses out. They're no fence. Don't preach against abortion. That's God's child. And unless the mother is threatened with her own life, she has a duty not to kill God's child. Now they can't even figure out who is a woman and who is a man. You are following a false God when you can't figure out and you say you believe the Bible. God clearly defines what is a woman and what is a man. I've had no problem with that all my life. But many in authority in our colleges have problems with it. Those same believers began to live a 
according to their flesh. And they were drawn away from Christ. Do you know how many people don't believe that Christ rose from the dead? And they go to churches all over the place? Do you really not know that many, many that go to church think there's another way to heaven but through Jesus Christ? And they don't teach on the blood of Christ because it's gross. We don't want to teach on that. It turns people off. And yet without the application of the blood of Christ on me, I am lost for all eternity. I'm glad I believe in the blood atonement. Today those same wolves are appearing again. Jesus warned of their coming in Matthew 7, 15. According to Christ, greedy preachers and teachers will come dressed as God's sheep. Oh, we believe the word. My dog needs an air-conditioned doghouse. I will come if you pay me thus and thus. I've never said that to any church I've ever served in. I come only because God told me to come, not because of what they will pay me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ, and you and I must serve God with that same attitude. No matter what the job may be, if it's God's job for me, I will do it without demanding a certain pay, I will give everything to God, even my income. Number five, according to Christ, greedy preachers and teachers will come dressed as God's sheep. They will appear as angels of light. No one's ever called me an angel, but God. To the angels that are in the churches, that's referring to a pastor, but the angel there means messengers. So the Word of God makes it very clear. These false leaders will come looking like godly leaders. I could mention some that are on the Internet but I won't do that. If you don't have discernment, you need to get discernment. Some of these individuals would rather have their name spread across the world than the gospel, the whole counsel of God. So they will appear as angels of light, but they will come to deceive even the elect, if possible, the Bible says. 90% of what they say will sound wonderful. I agree with that. It'll sound like the gospel, but they're using God's word as a cloak for their deception. If you can get 10% that isn't godly by giving 90% that is, you are a wolf. Number six, show me a preacher who never exposes sin, and I can think of some, who doesn't show people the difference between the holy and the profane, who doesn't mention repentance or judgment. No, I will not teach on judgment. But instead says God wants to make you rich and prosperous. And I'll call such a man what he is. He is a wolf. Do you know how many preachers out there have jets? Some of them not one, but many. Do you know how many of those preachers are paid exorbitant riches? You know what? Billy Graham did. He put all of this under a group of people 
And he said, you pay me what you want to pay me. And he did that until the end of his days. He was not in it for the money. His team was not in it for the money. They were in it because God called them to be in it. This preacher, this wolf, has substituted the cross for cash. An individual in this church years ago accused me of all, I, all you want is my money. I never got their money. The church got their money. Just because I asked them, asked the whole body to give a tithe, and it's totally scriptural in the old and in the new. Jesus said you should do that and not leave it undone. They thought all I wanted was money. But what did I get? I was paid a lower salary than I am now. I wasn't in it for the money. I was in it because of the call of Almighty God. It's their excuse not to tithe. And they're paying the price today. I know they are. Churches that once believed in sacrifice, self-denial, and cross-bearing had become corrupted by the flesh. You don't hear some of the counsel of God because it'll divide your church and it will cause people not to want to come to your church. We are responsible as shepherds to give all of the word of God, not part of it that people want. You cannot muzzle the mouth of the preacher of the gospel or you're in trouble. But they have tried. They have tried. Thank God. And I say this honestly, not this one. Not this one, because I've been a strong pastor because God told me the only way to save a church is to have a strong shepherd that won't tolerate sin or ungodliness or false gospels. Number seven, their focus is now totally on self, on material things, on the good life, not the holy life. You listen to somebody on the television that's preaching prosperity, and you know you're not listening to the right person. You're listening to a wolf. I don't care whether they're popular or not. If they're not preaching the whole gospel, when they're preaching materialism is important, it is not important, and many of them have a lot of materialism. What is important is that they're shepherds who are guarding the sheep from the wolves. Come to Jeremiah, though these wolves build their fortune on the back of poor, the poor and needy. Oh, they live good. They live rich. But the servants on the mission field, like Pastor Vincent, they live mouth to mouth. They serve God, not because of how much they're getting paid, but they serve God because God has given them that opportunity and they're going to do it to their dying day, even though the afflictions come upon them. Number eight, every shepherd of the Lord has been charged to guard his flock against the wolves. But so many, so many flocks get rid of the shepherd that's trying to guard them because the church isn't being built. Yes, the church is being built, but it's not the multitudes of the, that are being built. It's the church of Jesus Christ. There are many that go to church that aren't Christians at all. They're just religious. I don't care what church you go to, the core is keeping the church going. The multitudes sit in the pews and they give what they can afford and they don't volunteer to serve God in that church in any way. Why do you think we exist? Because God's people here 
are not that kind of people. But in many churches, they are that kind of people. Why does a pastor get worn out and go out? Just leave the ministries. Don't want to preach anymore. Because the people have been bitten by the wolves, and the wolves have destroyed the effectiveness of their ministry. And so they give up. They're like, Jeremiah, I'd rather not speak anymore. It, it's going, I'm, they're not going to listen to me. You told me they weren't. And they quit. When the church is full of wolves, they don't even see the need to go into all the world and present the gospel of Jesus Christ in any way they can through the Internet, through public access. You see, they don't see the need, but we see the need because God has given us this outlet and we're going to reach into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ more and more and more. So a shepherd must guard his sheep. These individuals seek out those who don't know the word of God and get them divided. Paul's concern for the flock was the same as the prophet Amos. Listen to the prophet Amos. The danger of a famine of the word of God, he taught. There is a danger of the famine of the word of God. You hear religion, you hear all kinds of things, but you don't hear the word of God. And in some countries, there is a famine. I had the privilege of watching on uh, TBS. That's the right one, right? Hmm? TBN, TBN. And it was uh, a evangelism that uh, Franklin Graham did in England. And they fought it. They fought it. The people of England fought it. They wouldn't let it. They finally canceled them, and they said, we're going to continue to pursue this because God's told us to do this. And the end result is too much I can't tell you now because it's no time. But the end result is that God came through, and the same people that said, we won't let you use our venue turned around and started to let them use it, and multitudes were won to Christ. Multitudes. We must fight the good fight with all our might. We must never give up. No matter what happens, we must continue. Though the devil's attacks grow greater and greater and greater, we have the Lord, and he fights for us. In Amos' day, Israel became an obsessed with the shekel and money and materialism. Doesn't it sound like today? Many churches build big edifices because not to minister to people, but so that they can leave a great heritage for somebody else to come and build a bigger barn. And you remember what Jesus said when this person said, ah, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And he built another barn. And God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul's going to be required of you. And then whose shall these things be? Only what I've done for the Lord will go into eternity. Nothing I've done for myself, nothing I've done to build up myself in somebody's estimation. I know that only that which I have done and what I, I will do to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ will be remembered in heaven. And the same for you. If you're sold out to Christ, you will go to heaven and your treasures will be laid up there. And you'll get rewarded from God, who is the great rewarder. The poor, it says, 
in Amos's day were being despised. The widows were being despised. All they thought of was themselves and what they could get from serving the people. How did the Lord react to such greed, such greed that was in Israel and is in America today? He told Amos these words. Listen to it in Amos 8, 11 to 13. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord God, that I, God, will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run in to and fro and seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day the fair virgins and the strong man shall faint for thirst. Amos 8, 11 to 13. What are they thirsting for? The word of God. If we keep putting down the word of God in any church, God's going to say, I'm not coming. And when God says, I'm not coming, the church is destroyed. I remember a ministry. And the ministry was not ours, but it was a great ministry. And it was a ministry to the people, young people in a camp and to the older people as well. We attended one of their services, uh, uh, their business meetings, I should say, and uh, my wife had to say something to them because they were doing this according to the world standards, and she said, shouldn't we pray? They hadn't thought about that. I don't know if they followed God, or if they followed the world. But I can tell you this, we should always go to God first and get what he wants in any decision in our lives. The one great concern of our Heavenly Father as we draw to an end is that we have no other gospel to, gospel to, re, to express to people. Number nine, if we allow anything to get in the way of the true gospel, we'll end up in a biblical famine. If I won't accept the gospel, then he won't give it. Paul warns of an even greater danger that's invading God's church. Paul told the Ephesians in Acts 20, verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things, things against the teaching of the word of God to draw away disciples after them. Number 10, the Greek word for perverse here means obstinate persistence in promoting an error. Obstinate persistence in promoting an error. Now Paul turns his attention to pastors who cower and shrink back from preaching the whole counsel of God. Number 11. He was speaking of those who present a watered down gospel and only a part of God's word. Paul stated to these men, Acts 20, 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I've laid the whole teaching of God to you that he's given to me. But are you preaching it to others? All the counsel of God is the whole Bible. Number 12, in short, the whole Counsel of God includes tough subjects of Scripture, not just the blessings of it. It includes preaching on exceedingly sinfulness in the church. It, pre it means preaching on hell. 
which people don't want to hear about. It means preaching something other than the rapture that they aren't ready to listen to or the second coming of Christ or the judgment. <laughs> 